So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the joint symposium organized by Japan Spotlight, Japan Economic Foundation, which is one of the most famous uh, international magazine and South Asia Research Center at Soka University. I'm Ui Teramoto. I am assistant oh. professor in, at Soka University and I am going to do MC today. It is our honor to welcome distinguished guests today from Japan Spotlight. Thank you so much for joining us. We today have distinguished guests, Mr. Hanao Yuki Haraoka, editor in chief, Japan Spotlight, Japan's Economic Foundation, who is going to share with us his insight on introduction and purpose of the of the meet, meeting. Um, we also have Professor Sil Beriat, who is going to talk to us about the Asian giants, China and India, their historical, cultural, and religious linkages. We also would like to welcome Mr. Mohan Gopar, who will talk to us about yoga as a guru, yoga as a guru for harmony. I would also like to welcome Dr. Rabindra, uh, excuse me, Dr. Rabinder Malik, who is a president of Discovery India Club, Japan, who will going to share Mahatma Gandhi's message of nonviolence and harmony. We also have Associate Professor Andrew Kamei Daich. I'm not sure if the pronunciation is correct, I hope, um, who is a professor at Aoyama Gakuin University and is going to share with us the topic Seeking an Intellectual Foundation for Inter-Asian Collaborations, the Sino-Japanese Historical Experience. Lastly, but not least, um, Dr. Aditya Pratap Dio, who is a professor in the Department of History, St. Stephen's College, India. Without further ado, I would like to start the symposium. I hope all of you enjoy this very special occasion. Before we begin, we would like to have welcome address by Professor Ryohei Tanaka, Director of the South Asia Research Center. Professor Tanaka, Okay, greetings to everyone present here today. I am Ryohei Tanaka, Director of Soka University South Asia Research Center and Executive Vice President of Soka University. South Asia Research Center was established on July 16, 2019, and its aim is to promote research and academic exchange between Japan and South Asia. We are very happy to welcome your participation here today at the symposium under the theme, Asia is one, Asian cultures and mind. I'd like to thank the guest speakers, Professor Cyril Beriat, Mr. Mohan Gapal, Dr. Rabinda Malik, Associate Professor Andrew Kamei Daichi, and Dr. Aditya Pratap Deo, who have taken our time to be here with us today. I would especially like to thank Mr. Naoyuki Araoka for helping in organizing today's symposium and for always supporting the South Asia Research Center events. Today, we have the keynote address by Professor Mukesh Williams, who is the backbone of the Research Center. He has been an integral part of Soka University for many years as a professor in the Faculty of Letters, and he has been responsible for the connection between Soka University and St. Stephen's College. Now as the advisor of South Asia Research Center, uh, he's helping us further strengthen our connection with South Asia and the South Asian universities. I hope you'll be able to have a fruitful session today. I'd like to thank you all for being here and please have a great symposium. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor Tanaka. Now, would, now we would like to have word by Mr. Naoyuki Haraoka, Editor-in-Chief, Japan Spotlight. Mr. Haraoka. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction, uh, Professor Teramoto. Uh, my name is Naoyuki Haraoka. I'm uh, uh, executive managing director of Japan Economic Foundation and also editor in chief of Japan Spotlight. Uh, you know, we are basically working on, generally working on uh, economy and uh, politics uh, or, uh, you know, trade and economic policy issues. Uh, but uh, having been working uh, these days, uh, on those matters, uh, I'm getting uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, conscious of uh, the importance of uh, soft power, the role of soft power in uh, mitigating uh, international uh, relations, uh, conflicts, uh, and confrontations. Today, uh, we see. Uh, so, uh, uh, my purpose uh, in, you know, helping uh, distinguish to Soka University uh, South uh, Asia Center uh, to organize this uh, symposium uh, is, uh, you know, to, to highlight the importance of uh, Asian soft power uh, in the context of today's uh, uh, international political uh, economic situations. Uh, let me first uh, uh, look at, uh, uh, you know, today's uh, polit political or economic political situation in, in the world. Uh, uh, the most significant, uh, perhaps, uh, factor to be mentioned in the context of international political economy today that is a lack of leadership in, in global governance. Uh, you know, it is true that we cannot depend upon the US leadership anymore. Uh, you know, the next US president, perhaps uh, Joe Biden, uh, would most likely respect multilateralism and the, uh, you know, the relationship with the allies. Uh, however, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the election outcome, uh, 2020, uh, perhaps uh, it will be very difficult to, to uh, you know, pursue uh, multilateralism uh, so as, you know, in the honesty. Uh, and uh, uh, I think many Americans still support the direction of uh, what we call American first policy. Uh, so Globalization most likely would go on without the US leadership or any other nation's leadership. Uh, in addition to you know, the globalization, uh, we have uh, another you know, significant uh, uh, economic uh, development that is a host industrial revolution that is uh, supposed to be widening the gap between the rich and the poor in addition to globalization. So uh, it is seen everywhere inequality is rising and uh, 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 due to the rising inequality, uh, there is a political divide and confrontation uh, among the people that's uh, intensified uh, significantly. So without any clear and consolidated leadership in the global community, this divide and confrontation in domestic politics has started to prevent any international collaboration. As the losers in the global competition under globalization tend to support the nationalism uh, becoming dominant today uh, in the stream of anti-globalization sentiment. Uh, the pandemic unfortunately uh, exacerbated this trend the nationalism enhanced and the inequality increased, divide and confrontation dominated not only among the nations, but also among people in a nation. 
And the mean, meanwhile, in order to contain the pandemic, uh, what uh, we will need, that's, I think, uh, social cohesion. So the nation, first of all, needs to trust the leaders and follow unanimously the instructions to contain the virus uh, provided by the leaders uh, with uh, expert support. Trusted leaders and social cohesion would be the most important to be needed to overwhelm the virus. Uh, second must be perhaps a decentralized policy decision. As a virus infection differs significantly by region, we should pursue regional community-based policy to contain it. We also need a diversity of knowledge and wisdom to cope with the uncertainty of the pandemic, which is uh, quite new to us. Uh, in this light, perhaps hierar hierarchical decision-making would not work well, but de decentralized decision-making would work better. Uh, to achieve social cohesion under such circumstances, uh, humanism must be a leading philosophy of a trusted leaders rather than material values based on uh, money or GDP. Uh, humanistic leaders will not leave anybody in the feeling of being left behind the social or economic trend or excluded and discriminated from the discriminated from the winners in the globalized uh, competition. The uh, political philosophy must be based on the thought to maximize human happiness rather than GDP. They see human happiness in high morality rather than material success. This is how the trusted leaders would be successful in achieving social cohesion. Uh, in this regard. I think our capitalistic thought is also faced with a challenge of paradigm shift. What I would like to say here is Asian soft power uh, could contribute well to such a paradigm shift of uh, Western thinking, namely capitalism, individualism, and community-based thought. Uh, and I think this should be achieved in the long run, not in the short run. Uh, whether uh, soft power is important in resolving an uh, international political issue or not, it's a very controversial issue. And uh, I know there are some people who would not to, you know, uh, respect soft power, uh, who would not consider soft power as a very important element to uh, affecting international politics. Uh, but I think at least in the long run, there would be some impact of soft power uh, in affecting uh, such, you know, uh, global tension in politics and the economy. And uh, Asia is the area of diversity consisting of the nations with a variety of historical and cultural backgrounds. Uh, but there is still a unique thought and philosophy to be shared by many Asian nations. That is respect for harmony and, and I think that is a useful concept for achieving social cohesion. It is true that respect for harmony could hamper uh, bigger for competition among individuals. Uh, but com uh, yes, competition is certainly a highly commendable element of today's capitalism, which maximizes a man and a company's uh, growth potential and achieve efficiency and thus economic growth. However, such a Western thought, as I told you, uh, it is the base of our contemporary capitalism itself, is facing a challenge in terms of growing need for social cohesion. Apart from the context of economy competition among the political, politi uh, apart from the context of economy, competition among the political entities could uh, march in struggle for political hegemony. In extreme cases, this would result in divide and conflict between, uh, between the countries, and that, uh, bear, that bears nothing fruitful. Uh, this is a time where we live, rising nationalism and populism against the background of social inequality in a nation, are pushing the nations to seek for power of politics in the globalized world, 
And as you know, the US-China Cold War intensified and could result in decamp, decamp, could result in decoupling of the world economy. Uh, against this background, we should come back to the thought envisaged and supported by Okakura Tenshin and uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore in the 19th century, that is Asia is one. In spite of great historical and religious diversity of Asian nations, as well as lots of conflicts and wars among, the, uh, among those nations, uh, they emphasize the concept of harmony and unity. Uh, starting with uh, studying over their thoughts, we would like to talk about the possible contribution of this Asian uh, philosophy and values to the current global uh, peace and stability. Uh, so that's uh, my uh, uh, introductory remark. And uh, uh, perhaps it's needless to say, uh, this is my personal idea and nothing to do with uh, uh, our organization, Japan Economic Foundation, but maybe maybe not so much inconsistency with what I'm working, what we are working on uh, in the foundation. Uh, that's, that's all uh, at this moment I would like to say. Uh, and uh, well, perhaps uh, uh, Professor Teramoto will be in charge of uh, introducing the other speakers. Hello. Ah, yes, Professor yeah. Teramoto is yeah. in charge of introducing the other speakers in the panel, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I would be very happy to uh, introduce uh, speakers uh, one by one by myself, but uh, it's up to you. Uh, Mr. Haraoka, yes. if, um, if, you, if you don't mind, would you please yes. go ahead and introduce? Okay, okay, okay fine. Okay. So, uh, uh, I would like, I'm going to introduce uh, our distinguished speakers in the panel one after another. Uh, first, uh, Professor Mukesh Williams, uh, we don't need any uh, introduction uh, about him, uh, but he's, uh, he's uh, uh, you know, the uh, co-author of this uh, uh, symposium and he is uh, happy to, he is ready to talk about uh, uh, you know, the Tagore and uh, uh, Okakura's uh, philosophy that is named Asia is one in his uh, keynote address. Please uh, go ahead, uh, Professor Mukesh. You have 20 minutes. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so, shall I begin with your permission, Mr. Haraoka? Please. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Yes. So, it is my honor to be speaking at the first. Uh, joint symposium of Japan Spotlight and South Asia Research Center, Soka University. And uh, today I want to talk about Tagore and Okakura Tenshin and what they thought about the Asiatic mind. Is there something called the Asiatic mind? <clears throat> so, Without much ado, let me begin. So the concept of Asia is one means to become one with the universe. So I would like to repeat this. The concept of Asia is one means to become one with the universe. Can this concept be used to create global governance, decenter the discourse of global Western capitalism and bring about global stability? Is it possible for Asian nations to work in harmony with Western nations in spite of the contentious and violent 
historical past. Both Rabindranath Tagore and Okakura Tenshin felt it was possible. Tagore felt that the voracious appetite of the West for material wealth, untruthful diplomacy and colonialism must give way to the cosmic humanity of Asia. The West needed Asia to complete itself. That was the thought. Tension realized the spirituality and the spiritual unity of Asia. And he felt it must prevail in the world. Though American transcendentalists like Emerson, Thoreau and Fuller were quite fascinated by the inherent goodness of man and nature, they created self-reliant and independent-minded individuals. So the cosmic and self-negating aspect of Asian civilization through the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita did not interest them as much as individual development. In recent decades, muscular nationalism, populism, and social inequalities have intensified conflicts between nations and peoples and are forcing them to decouple from world economy. America is first, Haruka san mentioned. That is a great slogan and continues to be. So, can the cosmic and humanistic harmony of Asia? in spite of its historical divisiveness, become a model for global peace and stability? So these are some of the questions that the Joint Symposium uh, may wish to unravel. <clears throat> the idea of Asia is one was first floated by Haroka-san, but we took it up to explore its efficacy in our divisive world. I will talk about Tenshin and Tagore. And uh, I think together, all of us, we have already introduced, Haruka San has introduced everyone. And uh, together, perhaps a new vision can emerge after this symposium. <clears throat> to me, the concept of Asia is one implies that if there is both tolerance and curiosity between the two great civilizations of the world, Asian and European, there may be many more within it, it is possible to develop an Asiatic trust in global governance, commerce, and culture, a global culture. I wish to term it as global Asiatic humanism. If some of us are uncomfortable with this nomenclature, we can call it global Euro-Asiatic cooperation. My point is, does the pandemic show us the need to cooperate with others? and concentrate on institution building? Does the Indian connection in the American presidential election show a new departure in American politics that both Tagore and Tension were talking about over a century ago? Only time will tell. Both Japanese and Indians believe that when an individual overcomes his self-centeredness, he can unite with the universe and become one with every creature in it. This is the Asiatic mind that Okakura Kakuzo alias Tenshin. 1863, he was born, died 1913, talked about. Tenshin introduced the concept of Gotenjiku, 
the Japanese concept of Gotenjiku or the five Indies, which was a Sino-Japanese Buddhist concept. Sino-Japanese Buddhist concept. He placed India at its center, gave a prominent place to China, a smaller place to Japan, Southern islands and Europe. So you can see it's a, it's a global perspective. Tenshin in his book, The Ideals of the East, it was published in 1903, begins with the phrase, Asia is one. This concept is a fusion of Chinese Confucianism and Indian Vedantic thought that gives rise to the ultimate and universal, the ultimate and universal. The ultimate is Confucian thought, and it means to live with others and become happy. The universal is Vedanta. It means that the universal self or the consciousness which identifies with everything in the universe must prevail. So the idea of the universal in Indian thought has to do with sameness, everything is same, or the logic of pluralization and moral imperatives based on moral principles. According to Tenshin, this is the common thought inheritance, quote unquote, common thought inheritance of the Asiatic race. The thought enables Asia to produce the great religions of the world and separates them from maritime Mediterranean and Baltic peoples who sought the means of life in the particular, the means of life in the particular, not the end in the universal. Tension praises the grandeur of Ashoka, but spins it to claim that Japan alone is the museum of the historic wealth of Asiatic culture. He concludes his book by saying that Asia will not be deluded by the West as it must be from Asia herself along the ancient roadways of the race that the great voice shall be heard. Therefore, Asia is one in its habit of the mind, the ways of its thinking and the conception of the universe. Tagore wrote in Asia's response to the call of the new age that if Asia is not fully awakened, then there is no deliverance for Europe as well. If Asia is not fully awakened, then there is no deliverance for Europe as well. By it, Tagore meant that Europe must give up colonization, single-minded acquisition of wealth, untruthful diplomacy, and embrace humanity. Both Tagore and Tenshin had their limitations given the time they were working and were born, but they tried to go beyond and embrace mankind. So both Tagore and Tenshin met a few times, um, but history has constructed their meeting as a friendship. Both played with the emerging idea of the common inheritance of Asia as a way to balance the dominance of Europe in the early 19th and the whole of the 19th and early 20th century. Intellectual ideas arising in Europe during this time made colonialism untenable. Tagore was a Bengali upper caste poet expanding his reach beyond the nation while Tenshin was a nationalist Japanese historian, imagining the centrality of Japan in Asia. 
it is possible to see a commonality in their passion to espouse a single spiritual brotherhood in Asia and offer it to the West to complete itself as a civilization. Their meeting did good to both. Tagore used Hindu values as a mark of Indianness, while Tension used Japanese aesthetics to imagine a conflated category of the Japanese nation. Tension in his book, An Awakening of the East, develops the earlier argument of claiming a singular identity and cultural exclusiveness for Japan. Both Tagore and Tenshin knew how to present a benign and spiritual image of Asia to the world and bring divisive races together. Tenshin was furiously collecting artworks from Japan and China, but hardly anything from India for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Perhaps he did not need artifacts from India as he already encountered its great spirituality. The tension was also involved in creating a new identity for Japan. Tagore was drawing attention to the ill effects of Western hegemony and universalizing the Upanishadic ideal of Vasudeva Kutumbukam, or the earth is one family. Interestingly, Tension saw a connection between Asian countries, but recognized the unbridgeable gulf between the East and West. His writings in English do not match his aspirations in Japanese. Yes, there were two different Okakuras. The English one was Kakuzo, and the Japanese one was Tension. His work for the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and friendship with Mrs. Gardner introduced him to the distinctive Western aesthetics, while his relationship with India and sister Nivedita and Tagore gave him an understanding of Indian aesthetics. Within a decade, he began to realize the impossibility of communicating his Western ideas to his Japanese audience. He was more emotional in his Japanese writings and rational in his English essays. Unless fired by emotion, ideas do not become incandescent or plausible. When Tagore visited Japan in 1916, he was disturbed by Japanese fascination with material things and did not mention tension in his lectures. In 1938, when he visited Japan again, he picked up a fight with Yone Noguchi over Japanese fascination with nationalism and war with China. Tenshin was more nationalist in his sentiment, but cosmopolitan in his writings, while Tagore was against nationalism and for universal values. It is interesting to note that Tagore's songs became national anthems for both India and Bangladesh, Tagore saw English as a useful language, but used Bengali to express subtlety of emotion and thought. Similarly, Tenshin used Japanese to write poetry, but English to do his intellectual work. Tenshin helped Tagore to develop his concept of old Asia through his ultra-nationalist conception of new Asia. Old Asia was intrinsic to Indian thought with its universal humanism. Tagore saw the ill effects of nationalist Asia without universal humanism. Tension died a year before the First World War began. He knew the ill effects of nationalism, but did not live to experience it. Tagore began to experience the rising tide of nationalism in Japan during the 1930s and was rather critical of its outcome. He developed a more oriental conception of Asia, which fitted into the old Asian ideal of keeping humanity at the center, what Haruka-san has been talking about. Tagore was deeply impressed by the poetic beauty of Japan. 
but gradually became disenchanted as he saw the rising tide of nationalism. There was a Tagore fever in Japan during the Taisho period, which is 1913 to 1926. And this resulted in strong reactions to his writings amongst Japanese artists and intellectuals. The relationship of Tagore with Japanese artists, especially with Taikan Yokoyama, Yone Noguchi, and Okakura Tenshin, is quite well known among scholars. In fact, Tenshin was the first Japanese scholar of arts with whom Tagore had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Both Tagore and Tenshin began to see Asia as a metaphysical and spiritual entity. The idea of universal spiritualism that includes all creatures within human consciousness is not new to Asia. A Japanese philosopher, Takeshi Uehara, Uemihara, suggested that survivors of tsunami must develop a new culture of including trees and plants in the quest for achieving nirvana. Somuku Kokudo Shikai Jobuts. This is a wonderful concept, but the idea is not new to Japan. Taisho writer of children's stories, Kenji Miyazawa, talked about the feelings of plants and animals similar to those of human beings. Miyazawa was deeply influenced by the humanistic philosophy of the Lotus Sutra. <clears throat> Tagore felt there was an ecological oneness between animate and inanimate life. Our dharma is to secure the bonds of life and bring peace and harmony in the world. <clears throat> he felt that Japan possessed this virtue and could transcend the negative influences of Western modernity and individualism. Both Tagore and Miyazawa felt that once man expands his consciousness by destroying his self and finds an aesthetic principle, he can coexist with nature. Miyazawa's works are very popular in Japanese textbooks since the World War, Second World War. Haruka-san, how much time do I have? It, uh, it's 20, almost 20 minutes, so you... you okay, uh, I will draw my conclusion, therefore. Uh, yes. I had a wonderful story, but I would not talk about that story. Mm -hmm. This is a story by Kenji Miyazawa, The Bears of Mount Namitoku, mm -hmm. how the bears become one with the hunter mm -hmm. and how they participate in a wonderful life together. So the story reminds us, the hunter and the hunted, of the self-immolation of the Buddha to feed a starving tiger. The bear dies for others and subverts the Darwinian edict, survival of the fittest. This is the way of the Bodhisattva. So in many other stories, Miyazawa uses Iwate as a dreamland in the desert of Tepankar, which is an imaginary name in Tagore's crescent moon in the section, the land of the exile. In Sadhana, Tagore believed that man has within him two birds, has two birds within him. The objective one with, the, with its business of life and the subjective one with its disinterested joy of vision. So in the religion of man, it is to realize a goal. In the end, I would like to say that Miyazawa's belief in vitalism or biologism, where life was a principle of one living organism. Mm -hmm. Miyazawa belonged to the Shirakawa school, which mm -hmm. rejected Confucianism and adopted Western ideals of expressionism and post-impressionism. But Miyazawa was also influenced by Nichiren's Buddhism and Tagore's concept of harmony of the universe 
aesthetic perception and self-abandonment. The story also tells us that every being lives through the sacrifice of the other. Tagore's sadhana or self-realization is to become one with the universe and dedicate oneself to an idea which can be God, nation, or love. As economics undergoes structural reforms in the wake of the pandemic, we realize how important it is to cooperate with each other and rebuild national and global institutions. In the shadow of the pandemic, the expansive ideas of Tagore and Tenshin bringing together Asia and finding its complementary uniqueness for the West acquires significance. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mukesh, for introducing us, uh, you know, very deep philosophy of Tagore and Okakura. Uh, and I think it's truly uh, deserve uh, promoting, uh, uh, you know, two authors' book uh, to the, not only in Japan, but also uh, in the rest of the world, in particular in Asia, so that uh, we can learn more about uh, you know, inclusiveness, uh, inclusive nature of uh, Asian philosophy. Uh, and uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Cyril Beriat, uh, Professor Emeritus at Sofia University. Uh, he's been also in Japan for a long time and a uh, very distinguished uh, scholar uh, on the uh, literature and also religion. Uh, so he kindly contributed an article about uh, uh, you know, China-India relations uh, to our magazine Japan Spotlight. So Professor Beriat, uh, uh, please, you, you have 15 minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I, I can hear you. Can you hear yes, me? Please. Yes. Well, my friends, before I begin, I'd like to express my gratitude to all the organizers. You know, some of you I've already met, like Mr. Haraoka and, you know, Dr. Malik and Mr. Mohan Gopal are very old friends of mine. I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you. Now, since I don't have too much time, I'd like to get into the topic immediately. You see, in 1995, the British author, Graham Hancock, he published a book entitled, The Fingerprints of the Gods. This book was translated into 27 languages and sold around 5 million copies worldwide. Based on a study of ancient maps and the myths of different religions, Hancock states that many of our ancient monuments that we have in the world today, like the pyramids of Egypt, the pyramids of Latin America, the Nazca lines of Peru and so on, were not created by people of our present civilization. They were built by members of a highly advanced civilization who inhabited this earth before our own civilization was born. That is the opinion of Hancock. In other words, there was another civilization before our own, and those were the people who erected those massive monuments. <clears throat> Hancock believes that the earlier civilization was destroyed by a mighty flood, but the monuments managed to survive. Of course, we have heard theories like this many times in the past, and this theory also was greeted you know, with wonder and skepticism. But what I personally found intriguing about Hancock was his view of civilizations. You see, Hancock suggests that civilization began in the world after 4000 BC. And before that, there was no civilization. The Sumerian and Egyptian civilizations began around 3000 BC, according to Hancock. <clears throat> and after these came the civilizations of the Indus Valley and China. The earliest civilization of China was the Shang. 
they heralded the Bronze Age in China and ruled from 1600 BC, while in India, the earliest civilization, the Indus Valley civilization, was said to have been between 2500 BC and 1000 BC. Of course, these are all the opinions of scholars, and as you know, scholars have different views. There is evidence that the people of the Indus Valley were in contact with Egypt and Sumeria. But did they have contact with China? This is a question that historians have yet to answer. Today, the distance from Beijing to New Delhi is 3,784 kilometers, according to some people. And the time taken to cover this by plane is about 13 hours. Of course, depending on the route that you take, all those things are, those factors have to be considered. Yet, this was not the case in the remote past. Early travelers from China to India and from India to China were forced to overcome a variety of obstacles. They journeyed by foot, by camel, donkey, or horseback through dense jungles, lonely deserts, over icy mountains, across pirate infested seas and rivers that were filled with crocodiles. Often they ran into bandits or unfriendly tribes who robbed them of all their possessions and many had serious health problems. The eminent Chinese scholar Fa Hian, this is a picture of Fa Hian. I hope all of you can see it. Yes. This eminent uh, Fa Hian, he's known in Japan as Hokkien. He was the Chinese monk of the Eastern Jin Dynasty. In 399 AD, he undertook a lengthy and fearsome journey to, to India, but he managed to reach India only after six long years. His entire trip to India and back spanned 14 years. And in the course of the journey, he set foot in 30 different countries. Like his onward journey, his return to China by sea was all also perilous and terrifying. And he undertook this journey when he was over 60 years of age. While he, in India, he studied Sanskrit, obtained many Sanskrit scriptures and returned to China in 414 AD. Fahian has left us an account of his journey entitled Record of the Buddhist Kingdoms. It's a magnificent work that gives us an insight into the Buddhist beliefs of those days. Now, in another part of the world, in Samarkand, the capital of Uzbekistan, you see a magnificent tomb called Guri Amir. It is the tomb of Tamar Lane, or sometimes historians call him Timur the Lane. He was, in the 14th and 15th century, he was emperor of vast areas of Central Asia. Timur, according to historians, was a fearful and ruthless warrior who believed that if he overcame both India and China, overcoming Europe would be no problem at all. <clears throat> While Timur did manage to ransack Delhi, he was unable to subdue China because he died in 1405. Timur, however, serves as a link between India and China because the founder of the Mughal Empire in India, Zahiruddin Mohammed Babur, was a descendant both of Timur and Genghis Khan, the Mongol Emperor of China. The Mughal Empire lasted 
from 1526 to 1540 and from 1555 to 1857. Now, when we observe some of these Mughal paintings, we notice at times that the vanguard of the Mughal army, you know, the people right in front, they carry the banner of Genghis Khan. This was because all the 19 Mughal emperors took great pride in the fact that they, that they were descendants of the Mongol emperor Genghis Khan. However, my personal opinion is that the noblest exchange between China and India was brought about by the Buddhist monks. These monks journeyed from China to India or India to China as missionaries or pilgrims at a time when such travel was not easy and they were all eminent scholars who communicated faith and culture. In fact, for many centuries, Buddhism served as a key vehicle for the transport of faith and culture, not only between India and China, but other nations as well. I shall now, since I don't have too much time, I shall now speak in detail of four of these monks. Two of them were Indians and two of them were Chinese. The first is Kumara Jiva. Kumara Jiva was born in 343 AD. He died in 409. He was a high ranking Buddhist scholar and translator he is noted for his in-depth grasp of Buddhism and revered as one of the greatest translators of Buddhist scriptures. He translated from Sanskrit to Chinese and his translations include the Lotus Sutra, which is called the Hokkekyo or Myoho Rengekyo in Japan, the Meditation Sutra, the Wisdom Sutras and many others. Kumara Jiva was a child of noble birth. He was raised in the Central Asian city of Kucha. His father was an Indian, a distinguished Hindu of the Brahmin caste, and his mother was a Kachian princess. He entered monastic life when he was seven years old, and he did this out of a desire to imitate his pious mother who later, with the consent of her husband, became a Buddhist nun. Kumara Jiva was ordained a monk at the age of 20, after which his mother went to India to lead the life of a Buddhist nun. Before departing, however, knowing of her son's desire to spread the teachings of Buddhism in China, she warned him of the difficulties of the task before him, of the need on his part to rely on his own strength, and of the fact that he would get no material benefit from this life. To this, her son gave the following reply. The way of the Bodhisattvas of Mahayana is to seek the interests of others and to ignore themselves. If I can transmit the doctrine of the Lord Buddha and lead to enlightenment, living beings who have fallen into a life of illusion, then even if I have to endure the greatest tortures, I will not have the least regret. Kumara Jiva died in 409. He was not just a monk and translator, but a scholar, envoy and diplomat of the highest order a true builder of bridges between India and China. Now, the next person I'd like to speak of is Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma is generally said to have been the founder of Zen Buddhism, but that again depends on how you look, you regard, you know, the foundation of Zen. He was born in 470 AD and died in 543 AD. Zen, as you know, is referred to as Chan in China, 
And this word arose from the Sanskrit word dhyana or meditation. On entering China, he taught his disciples how to meditate and many wise sayings, aphorisms are attributed to him. Bodhidharma is the 28th patriarch of Buddhism and the first Chinese patriarch, an almost mythical figure. He was reportedly the son of the king of Kanchipuram. Kanchipuram is a city in South India. And he came to China in 520 AD. He met the Chinese emperor, but when the emperor asked him questions, he gave very enigmatic replies, which people did not understand. And so he was dismissed. He then tried to enter the famous Shaolin temple but the monks of the temple were suspicious of him. And so he lived in a cave and meditated for nine years facing a wall. The Shaolin temple has links to the martial arts of China, as all of you I'm sure know, particularly Kung Fu. But historians, at least many historians say that although Bodhidharma was eventually accepted by the Shaolin monks, there is no evidence that he communicated the knowledge of the martial arts to them. A famous incident concerns his accepting a disciple who became the second patriarch of Zen. The disciple was a man in his forties, a Confucian scholar, and to prove that he was sincere, apparently he cut off his left arm while standing in the snow. Bodhidharma was greatly impressed. He received him and named him Huike, which means efficient wisdom. And Huike became a world famous monk. Bodhidharma is revered by practitioners of Zen Buddhism, by the people of South India, and by practitioners of the martial arts, especially the martial arts of China. Now, the next person I'd like to speak of is Wan Zhang. See, there are two eminent monks I'd like to speak of. Both of them travel to India. Of the Buddhist masters we know, there is none like Wan Zhang. He was a spiritual and scholarly giant. In Japan, we refer to him as Genjo. He was a Tang Dynasty monk. He went to India in 629 to look for Sanskrit scriptures. He returned to China in 645 with 657 Sanskrit scriptures, several Buddhist images, and relics of Shakyamuni Buddha. And he spent his time translating many Sanskrit works. Wan Zhang has left us a record of his travels to India. It is not only a wide and substantial record of the Orient, but a supreme reference work in Indian history. The emperor denied him permission to leave China, yet he escaped to India in secret. And on his return to China 17 years later, the same emperor gave him a hero's welcome. There are two issues linked to his residence in India that draw our attention. One is the time he spent at the great Buddhist University of Nalanda, and the other is the personal rapport he established with the great Hindu emperor Harsha Vardhana. Nalanda University was a leading institution of the ancient world. In Huangzang's time, it had halls, observatories, dormitories, and over a hundred lecture halls. Huangzang states that the students numbered about 3,000 and they hailed from nations like Java, Tibet, Central Asia, China, and Mongolia. Some were world renowned scholars, as for example, Padma Sambhava of Tibet and Shanti Deva and Chandrakirti of India. 
it was a rendezvous for the literati of China and India. Quan Zhang passed away in 664 AD, but his memory is a reminder to people of China and India as to how much they possess in common. Now, the last person I'd like to speak of is Yi Jing. Yi Jing, who followed Wan Zhang to India, was also a Chinese monk of the Tang dynasty. He left for India in 671 and returned to China in 695 with many scriptures and Buddhist relics. In Japan, he's referred to as Gijo. As a child, he had a great esteem for his eminent predecessors, that the Fahian and Huang Zhang, and dreamed of imitating them. When Huang Zhang died in 664, Yi Jing was 29 years of age. He attended his funeral. And at the age of 37, he went to India. He spent 10 years at Nalanda University, involved in study, research, the collection of scriptures, and the copying of Sanskrit scriptures. He returned to China in 695, where he was warmly welcomed by the Empress Wu Zetian. And from then on until his age, at the age of 79, he was engrossed in translating 400 and odd scriptures. All of you, I'm sure, know the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen has described Yi Jing as the greatest Chinese astronomer and mathematician of his days. Thank you very much. I think I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Beriat, uh, for uh, your wonderful stories of Buddhism, uh, you know, exchange uh, between uh, China and uh, uh, India. Uh, certainly, uh, Buddhism is a very important uh, common asset uh, for Asia, and that's a part of a very important part of Asian identity. Um, well, uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Mohan Gopal. Uh, Mohan, are you uh, yep. here with us? Good evening, Haroka san. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mohan is a yoga master, and so uh, he talks about uh, uh, you know the importance of yoga as a, as a concept uh, of uh, reuniting uh, Asian countries. So please, uh, Mohan, you have 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just share uh, some slides, a slide deck with everybody. Uh, can everybody see the deck? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, <laughs> at the outset, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Haroka-san. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Veliat, uh, Professor Mukesh, uh, and uh, also uh, other distinguished guests and speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have to uh, make a small correction to the to the very generous introduction which uh, Haroka-san has made of me. I've got to mention that I'm not a yoga master myself. Uh, I'm a practitioner, and uh, that too, not, I must admit, I'm a practitioner of uh, meditation rather than yogic uh, asanas. But, but yes, I've been associated with uh, yoga in the bigger term for the past uh, 25 years or so. So thank you, Haroka-san. So um, I'm actually connected with an organization called The Art of Living. And which is one of the, which is said to be one of the largest N NGOs in the world. And uh, so it's completely voluntary. And for the past 25 years, I, I've been very closely associated with, with the art of living. It's based in Bangalore in India. And I, uh, I essentially coordinate the activities of art of living in Japan. 
So let me begin with uh, yoga. I know yoga is a very well-known word, especially now, and everybody would know it. I'll just touch upon it once again. So for a lot of us, yoga has different meanings. I think for many of us, it's uh, some very strenuous, difficult postures which are made, and especially in Japan, it seems to have had the connotation of uh, postures which are made by resilient and you know resilient ladies and it has never been it has really not been associated in japan with uh, with men or anybody else other than, other than let's say dieting for ladies fortunately i've got to say that that uh, concept of yoga is changing in japan yoga in itself ha- is means the ultimate union so it's a Sanskrit word. It's, uh, it's the ultimate union. Now, the ultimate union of what? It's the ultimate union of body, mind, physique. And that is what yoga represents. So what we see as those interesting postures and things like that, that's only one small part of yoga. Yoga in its fullness includes meditation, it includes harmony, it includes uh, certain, you know, recommendations regarding diet and so other things. Number two is that we can look upon as yoga being complete. So what does this mean? It means it's holistic. As I said, it talks about food, it talks about medical practices, it talks about posture, breathing, lifestyle and wisdom so it's supposed to be a complete science or art if you can call it that way and finally just want to point out that uh, yoga of course uh, is supposed to have emerged in india but from there it has made its way into the rest of asia uh, and from across the world So a lot of these concepts of yoga have got embedded in the Asian psyche. Almost whichever Asian country we take, and especially Asian countries which are uh, India eastwards, so from India to Japan, including China, Mongolia, Southeast Asia, yoga has been somewhere in that cultural context of uh, Asia, it has formed a very uh, deep basis, a very deep foundation. So once again, what is, let's go a bit deeper into what is yoga. So referring to yoga as a science, because yes, there are a lot of research work, there's a lot of research work which has been, which is being done into yoga currently. Uh, It's been going on (laughs) <laughs> and it essentially connects the body and the emotional system, the physical system and the emotional system through the breath. So what it effectively achieves is a, is a, is a wonderful synergy between the body and the mind using the breath, our own breath, as the tool. So what happens as a result for the physical body? It gets rid of stress from the physical body. It improves circulation and various other biological functions. For the mind, it eliminates mental stress and it uh, brings about a huge uh, increase in the awareness. So what does this mean? The mind calms down and from a centered mind, the decisions which we take The way we interact with people, everything undergoes a very fundamental change. And this is achieved by the breath, which essentially has the purpose of regulating the energy flow, which happens within the body, and also reducing the thinking overflow. Now, what is the thinking overflow? Our minds. We all know that our mind, our brain, is a constant, is an ever-active unit, which is churning out thoughts, which is analyzing, which is planning, which is uh, either disturbed or it is excited or it is happy at different times. And even within a single day, 
even within a single hour of a mind can go through an amazing variety of different states lot of it often results in an overflow we get confused or we are upset but it is this breath of ours which regulates that and which helps in reducing the way our mind goes like a wild animal here and there so the breath so the basis of yoga is the breath so what is this power of the breath so if we observe our breath just a little we would notice that when we experience different emotions our breathing pattern changes you can notice so let's say you, you let's say you get the news that you have won a lottery a huge lottery just observe your breathing patterns and you'll find you know the excitement which it creates you'll find your breathing is uh, suddenly becoming faster there is excitement and so on or let's say there has been something not so nice something sad which has impacted you you will notice that your breath shallows down it goes down you may start sighing a lot again it's the breath it's visible in the breathing pattern or let's say when we are upset we are angry or frustrated you may notice very short quick breaths happening so for every emotional state there is a breathing pattern a subtle breath pattern now we all have experienced stress and we know that stress is something which uh, we really would like to avoid what does stress result in if you start getting older uh, grays start getting wrinkles you get different diseases you feel exhausted <laughs> anxious depressed there are various uh, behaviors which come uh the way you interact with people changes and if you look at it all these things the basis is stress it's not that there is a certain individual or a person who is who is born bad or anything like that it's it's the stresses which we face which we undergo day in and day out that impact the way of a body mind system functions now a stress need not necessarily be something which um, you know we are aware of the stress you have a lot of work you have a deadline to meet and there is a stress yes those are also stresses but stresses also get built right from childhood now let's say a child is about to dash across the street now the guardian the mother shouts stop abunai watch out now it's it's necessary it's absolutely important for that to be said and done but the fact remains is that a that a kind of a twitch a stress gets created inside so it's inevitable from the time we are born it is inevitable that we will have stresses which build up across life and these impact the memory the learning systems our immunity it has a chain reaction and a fairly complex reaction in the tail now let's again go back to energy so what did we see we we saw the breath now let's go into the energy part what are the sources of energy we all know the main source is food and drink yes we need food we need water we need sleep just imagine if one has been 
a week one one night two nights three nights you don't want to meet that person on the fourth day sleep is absolutely essential number 3 our own breath it's what is there from the moment we are born until the last breath every second we are breathing and we cannot stop breathing for you know more than a few seconds so the breath sustains us then we could say there's beauty you know you see something a, be- a beautiful flower nature you see water flowing see mount fuji with its snow capped peak there is something which happens inside there is a sense of peace which dawns so that has a it's calming it's peaceful so this is also a source of energy a calming energy and then the fifth source which we have consistently ignored or didn't know about its existence is meditation so meditation is the fifth source of energy and it can bring in tremendous power to to our body mind complex so meditation can be called the ultimate relaxation now very often meditation is mistaken as concentration now concentration could be an outcome of meditation but you know there are techniques where where it is said focus on a dot make sure no thoughts come in and things like that but let's accept it the human mind the mind is a dynamic living force there will be thoughts coming and there is a principle of the of call which is the more you resist the more it will persist you know there's a famous story told by a master who says that who tells his disciple i'm going to now we are now going to meditate but you must do one thing you can think of everything whatever comes in the world you can plan you can think you can don't worry don't stop any of your thoughts that you can think but you will not think of three dancing monkeys whatever happens you will do not think of three dancing monkeys otherwise you are free to think of everything else so the, the disciple said oh yeah this is fine we shall not think of three dancing mm-hmm. monkeys ah, that's fantastic well, of course we'll be able to make it every can everybody can guess what happens they sit down and right through that 15 20 minutes all that they've been thinking every time they do something they see three dancing monkeys so this is our brain our brain itself is like a monkey and we cannot put a pressure on it you know cap it because if we do somewhere it bursts that's its nature so what does medic meditation do it's a way where you let go you just let go it's something like what we do when we sleep if we are going to sleep we will say i'm going to sleep so what do we do we may dim the lights we may switch on the lights maybe put some nice music maybe and we will lie down but then if we, if we keep saying i'm going to sleep i'm going to sleep i'm going to sleep after we lie down do we go to sleep not at all you won't be able to fall asleep the moment you let go that's when you fall asleep meditation is very similar except that you are sleeping with a sense of awareness you are there is the mind is still aware and very sharp so it comes to practice there are techniques this particular photograph i liked it a lot because what we see is zen it's you know the stone 
you have the Zen rocks over there, and there you have this leaf, which seems to be meditating. So it's a beautiful photograph which represents, you know, the concept of Zen in meditation. Now going to Asia, the Asian connection. So we, I brought in a few pieces, bits and pieces from here and there about yoga, but it all ties up, you know, the breath, yoga, meditation, all these pieces fit in like a jigsaw puzzle. Now what we see here is a shrine. It's a small shrine uh, known as the Omi Hachimanga. It is in Shiga prefecture. <coughs> close to, it's somewhere close to Maibara and Otsu in Shiga prefecture, close to, almost on the uh, shores of Lake Biva, Bivako. So over there, two years back in 2018, there was an interesting function which we had, a ceremony where we combined one yogic practice. This yogic practice is called a Rudra Puja. I won't go into the details of it, but it's a, one can call it a Vedic practice. And the, the head of the shrine of Omi Hachimanga, he was uh, very keen on having this uh, event in the precincts of the shrine. So this was done there. There was a master who conducted this, who was visiting us. And uh, so this is the event. And it was an interesting synchronization where we had on one hand a Vedic uh, process being in a Shinto shrine, in the beautiful natural surroundings of a Shinto shrine, which essentially forms the basis of yoga. It's one aspect of yoga. And this is an aspect which if we go back to what I said about it being in the Asian subconscious, whether we take Buddhism, whether we take Shinto, whether we take Hinduism, if we take, or even a lot of the local practices of Asia, there is this subconscious basis of yoga, which is there. Now, we are talking of yoga as the glue for harmony. Over here, this is an event which happened in New Delhi in 2016. It was called the World Culture Festival. Across three days, there were about three and a half million, million people who gathered. A huge stage, walking from one end of the stage to the other, that itself was several kilometers long. It was built for the occasion. And here, this is an evening, nighttime view of that stage. So the reason why the basis of this event was yoga. It was organized by the Art of Living. The whole basis was yoga, holistic yoga, about how yoga in its holistic sense can unite the whole world. And here we see yoga practitioners from different countries from about 156 countries, they had gathered there and everybody practicing. And you're talking of about 500 people practicing all together. Over here, if you can notice on the left-hand side, you've got attendees who have come from the People's Republic of China. You've got attendees from Taiwan. Everybody sitting together over here on the right, world leaders from the Gulf states, from other countries. So it is remarkable and everybody has this look of joy and happiness. So, so many people from a wide variety of cultures, religious backgrounds, uh, different, completely different socioeconomic strata. Everybody gathered for those three days. And what were they doing? The common, common word was harmony, that we are all one. Humanity is one. And this can be realized through the effect of yoga.
So in essence, if something like that can be done, if we can get people from absolutely differing, you know, where political considerations keep people apart. I know when, when my wife, uh, she, she did the yoga teacher's training program, her classmates, so to say, batchmates at the Bangalore Center was an Israeli lady and a Palestinian lady. In the same room, three ladies were sharing a room, which was, and the three ladies were a Jewish lady from Israel, an Arab lady from Palestine, and my wife, an Indian, South Indian. So, and everybody in harmony with the same goal of being at peace with each other. So this is something which is realizable. It is being proven. So the more we take this yoga as the basis, as harmony, for harmony, Asian harmony expanded to global harmony, it can be done. Thank you. This, thank you very much. And this I end my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Mohan, uh, for your interesting and wonderful presentation about yoga practice. Uh, you know, perhaps another way to uh, harmony and happiness. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. And uh, uh, I'm sorry about uh, my poor time management. Uh, we still have uh, three speakers uh, left, uh, but uh, it's it's almost to, it's uh, uh, it's six o'clock. So. Uh, if everybody agrees, uh, uh, I would like to ask you uh, to extend uh, uh, another half, a, half an hour uh, for this uh, symposium. So it, the ending time should be 7 instead of 6.30. Uh, would, that, would it be all right? Yes, Mr. Haraoka. OK. Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Lavinda Marik. Uh, he is, uh, Distinguished President of Discover India Club Japan, uh, and uh, uh, you know he's been uh, in Japan uh, for a long time, and he's been a distinguished professor at the uh, United Nations University and also Keio University, uh, and also he was he has been uh, uh, working as a coordinator of TERI, uh, the Energy and Resources Institute. Uh, which is uh, one of the most well-known uh, uh, global environment uh, uh, protection research institutes. Uh, he's talking about uh, Mahatma Gandhi's message of non-violence and harmony. Uh, he's been actually organizing uh, the events at the Indian Embassy in Tokyo uh, for you know Mahatma Gandhi's uh, uh, you know uh, message uh, inheritance. So please. Uh, uh, Dr. Marik, you have floor. 15 minutes, please. You are mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. We thank can you. Hear you. Yes. Uh, thank you again, and for the great pleasure to to say a few words about the message of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was the preeminent leader of Indian nationalism in British India, British ruled India. He is referred to as the father of the nation or Bapu in India, employing non-violent civil disobedience, Gandhi led India to independence. He also inspired movements for non-violence, civil rights, and freedom across the world. Most notably, uh, leaders like uh, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, and others, uh, they were uh, greatly, they, they got inspired by the message of Mahatma Gandhi in their own respective freedom movements. 
And also the International Day of Nonviolence is celebrated on Gandhi's birthday, October 2nd. Mahatma Gandhi was born and raised in a Hindu community in Gujarat state. He, he was trained in law in London and he became famous by fighting for the civil rights of Indians in South Africa and uh, uh, using techniques of nonviolent civil disobedience that he developed himself. And returning to India in 1915, he set about organizing farmers' peasants to protest excessive land taxes. And Mahatma Gandhi was a, a real, uh, uh, he reached out to all religions. He, he was uh, an opponent of communism. And he could not accept the idea of untouchability. And he campaigned against, furiously against, uh, in this, this, against it. And he made cleaning of toilets a common activity for everyone in the ashram that he was running. And Gandhi led nationwide campaigns for easing poverty, for expanding women's rights, building religious and ethnic harmony, increasing economic self reliance and above all, for achieving Swaraj, the independence of India from British domination. But Mahatma Gandhi's greatest contribution to humanity is his message of nonviolence as the way to harmony, peace, and justice. He taught that nonviolence was not just a refusal to kill, it was the action of love and truth as a force of positive social change. Indeed, he insisted that nonviolence was the most active and powerful force at work for good among the human beings. In his opinion, nonviolence always works because it uses the method of suffering and love to melt the human heart. Gandhi expanded extended his experiment in non-violence to non-violent resistance, non-cooperation, and civil disobedience. He remained committed to his belief in non-violence, even under oppressive conditions, and in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges. The theory behind his actions, which included encouraging mass civil disobedience to British law, for example, the historic Salt March in 1930, was that just means lead to just ends. He felt that it was irrational to try to use violence or hatred to achieve a peaceful and harmonious society. And also, I should add that he was much ahead of his time. Although in during Gandhi's lifetime, there were no debates on environment and development, but he was nevertheless much ahead of his time and was deeply conscious of the environmental concerns that our world is facing today. As is clear from his statements and writings, but above all, from the very simple and sustainable personal lifestyle that he followed all his life. Gandhi was a real practitioner of sustainable development in the real sense of the word. His whole life was a message and a lesson on environment and sustainable development, not only for Indians, but also the world at large to follow. And he made a, a statement, I think you all know, the earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not every man's greed. The world today is faced with many challenges, such as to preserve the planet, peacefully resolve conflicts and terrorism, prevent natural disasters, 
and elevate poverty and humanitarian crises around the world. There is a need for a major rethink on social, economic, environmental, basic values in all the parts of the world, basic on my own, based on my own long experience of working in different countries for United Nations, I strongly believe that the life of Mahatma Gandhi is a message for action by the world as a whole to improve the lives of people living on this planet. Gandhi is perhaps the most well-known Indian in the world today. And I hope that his message will be read more and known more around the world because I think it will be a great help. Now in a brief presentation like this, it's not possible to cover all that Mahatma Gandhi tried to achieve uh, during his lifetime. One way to get an idea of the depth and breadth of his thoughts is to read through some of his quotes. His quotes are really fantastic. Uh, and they explain the whole philosophy. For example, be the change that you wish to see in the world. I think this is the phrase that I would like all young people of today to memorize and remember that if you want to see a change in this world, then you must do something yourself. You can't just wait and for that to happen. Another famous phrase he used is that, an eye for an eye will only make the whole world blind. And uh, there are many, so what I would suggest if somebody cannot read all about him, at least some of his phrases will lead, then one can get some insight into that. And I don't want, to, because there is not much time, I don't want to extend it too long. Uh, I would like to conclude by thanking for this opportunity. I have been in Japan half my life. And uh, I am an Indian and Japan. And, and I believe that I feel at home here because I'm an Asian. We are Asians. Asia, uh, even the way th people are, things are done may be different in different countries, but our values, our, uh, there are some basic similarities. So I believe that Asia, getting together has a message for the whole world, I believe, and of harmony and peace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Marik, uh, for your excellent presentation on Mahatma Gandhi. And also, uh, uh, in particular, your last message uh, concerning uh, Asian uh, identity. Um, so the next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Andrew Kamei Daichi. Uh, he is a professor at Aoyama Gakuin University, uh, another distinguished expert on the history of uh, 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 you know, the exchange of uh, cultural inheritances among the Asian countries. Uh, he also kindly contributed uh, uh, his uh, interesting articles to our e-magazine Japan Spotlight, uh, and in particular, you know, in the, the article uh, titled here, uh, Seeking an Intellectual Foundation for Inter-Asian Collaboration, the Sino-Japanese Historical Experience. Uh, he's an expert on particularly uh, on the issue of publication history uh, in Asian countries. So please, uh, you have a floor, Professor. Uh, Kamei Daichi. Thank you very much, Haruka san. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Wonderful. Please. Yes, yes. Uh, I would dispute. I, I would dispute the description of me as uh, as an expert. I'm just a scholar. But uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I have some slides I'd like to put up if that is all right. Yes, you can do that. Yes. Can everybody see that? All right. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, may I begin? 
go ahead, please. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. I'll try to be quick. As a historian, I am often asked to put contemporary issues in historical perspective. However, most people have little idea about history and simply expect to be told that things are the way they are now because they have always been so. Popular culture and modern myths often reinforce these ideas. The historical reality, of course, is often quite different. When we look at the issue of inter-Asian relations, a popular notion is that fundamental cultural differences keep Asian countries apart. This is particularly the case in terms of Japan's relations with its neighbors, where even more than the impact of the Second World War and historical memory, which are of course manipulated by political figures for their own benefit, uh, there is a tendency to reduce everything to culture. Now this idea is popular because it appeals both to nationalists on the right who want to argue for their own country's fundamental uniqueness, and at the same time, social critics on the left who can criticize other countries for not abiding by what they see as global standards. Thus, we constantly see essays and op-eds by people, usually commentators, uh, arguing that inter-Asian conflict is rooted in cultural difference. Now, I feel that not only is this superficial reductionism, but it's usually simply false. Often, the writers do not understand the issues that they are engaging with, so they reduce them to culture as a way of making sense of it for their audience. If we consider Sino-Japanese relations in particular, the tensions and mutual suspicion that have, despite variances in degree, largely been the norm since the latter 20th century, are ultimately rooted in geopolitics more than in some sort of vast cultural divide. Now, it's not my intention today to analyze the specifics of that geopolitical uh, issue which are broadly bound up with China's reemergence as a world power and its political and economic conflicts with Japan as it's both its modernizing predecessor and one time would be colonizer. Rather, I intend to show how this situation is atypical. It, rather, it is in fact historically exceptional because Sino-Japanese relations were for many centuries characterized by active economic, cultural and intellectual exchange in an environment of more or less mutual respect. What intellectual foundation enabled such exchange? And could it be reclaimed and or revised in the present to accommodate an environment of renewed exchange and collaboration alongside, but without diminishing, geopolitical concerns? Now, obviously I can't go into all of that, but those are some of the things I want you to think about while I'm sort of giving the historical context. So, in this presentation, I attempt to pursue this line of inquiry and ask what lessons the Sino-Japanese historical experience can offer for contemporary efforts to seek a basis for connecting cultures more broadly across Asia. All right. Tracing the earliest Sino-Japanese relations is difficult because they began before Japan had developed writing meaning that we must depend on archaeological evidence and Chinese records. We know that in the first century CE, when Japan consisted of several micro kingdoms, one of these rulers was recognized by the Han imperial court, which bestowed upon him a golden seal. In the third century, Chinese officials at the court of Wei, one of the three kingdoms, expressed wonder at envoys from Queen Himiko a Japanese ruler who had brought peace to her realm and ruled her subjects through ritual authority. The Chinese officials were generally skeptical of women rulers, even more those who practiced what they saw as witchcraft, which is a somewhat ironic observation in light of how ritual rulership had been such a fundamental part of ancient Chinese kingship a long time before it was supplanted by the imperial system in 221 BCE. Nevertheless, they respected the queen's position and granted her a gift of bronze mirrors, and I have some examples here, and opened official relations between Himiko's state of Yamatai and the kingdom of Wei. During the Azka and Nara periods from the 6th to 8th centuries, 
by which time Japan had developed a system of writing based on Chinese characters and consolidated a royal state in the Kenai region, Sino-Japanese relations flourished. Japan traded silver, lumber, and other resources for a range of Chinese products, including art, ceramics, and books. In the latter case, Japanese literacy brought with it a great influx of writings from Tang China, setting off a boom in the arts and intellectual development in philosophy and literature, as well as in the practical areas of astronomy, medicine, city planning and engineering, statecraft, and many more. In Japan, the bulk of this new knowledge was lumped together under the term Chinese learning. Scholars and monks traveled back and forth between the two countries, further encouraging exchange. And of course, that was already brought up in an earlier presentation. So the importance of monks traveling back and forth and spreading knowledge and so forth, very important. Um, moreover, Japanese fashion trends at the time merged Chinese and Japanese styles. And the new Japanese capital of Heijoukyo, which is of course today's Nara, was built in 710, following the city design of the Tang capital of Chang'an, a precedent that continued to be followed when Heian-kyo, or Kyoto, was established in 794. Through China, Japan was connected to the so-called Silk Road network, so this big trading network that reached across Asia, enabling it to access trade goods from as far away as India. And so we have uh, just a couple of things I want to show quickly here. Here is an image from the inside of a Kofun excavated in 1972. This is an important source for us historians because we have depicted here some images of the fashion that people were wearing in the court at the time. And so these are examples of how the Japanese court were combining continental fashions with Japanese fashions to make new styles. So it's a very important source for that time. And here, just quickly, this is a schema that's been reconstructed of what uh, Chang'an, the Tang Dynasty capital, looked like. And we can quickly compare that to Heijoukyo, and we see very, something very similar there. The grid layout of the city, the palace in the north facing south, the division between east and west markets, it's all very similar. And here, of course, is Heian-kyo, so Kyoto, and again, we find the same sort of pattern. So that's an example of that sort of impact. All right. Uh, now, a key part of the intellectual foundation shoring up Sino-Japanese relations in this era was undeniably Buddhism, as several of my other uh, presenters have discussed today, uh, which had been first introduced to Japan by the Korean kingdom of Baekje in the year 738. And after a period of initial conflict, it had become part of Japanese state ideology. And of course, at the time, it was already strongly supported by Tang China as well. Buddhism was important because it also provided a basis for intellectual exchange among Japan, China, and India. And again, as was mentioned, monks circulated among these three countries, uh, it leading to a very important sort of intellectual and cultural exchange. Because Buddhism viewed the material world as an ephemeral image of reality and emphasized the shared suffering of all sentient creatures, it provided a good framework for dealing with others in an environment of mutual respect, recognizing cultural differences as merely the result of an endless variety of creation instead of fundamental barriers to exchange and understanding. So that, I think, is a very important point. Today, modern people are very quick to say, oh, well, there's cultural difference, and that's the end. Whereas from an ancient Buddhist perspective, saying there's cultural difference is the start of a discussion rather than the end of a discussion. So I think that's an important point to note there. Uh, now, whether some form of Buddhism could serve the function of its supporting inter-Asian collaboration today would be a very interesting proposition. Uh, certainly, generally, Buddhist ethics continue to feature in many Asian societies. Uh, they've often been merged with other ideas, of course. Um, one possible issue might be the tension between Mahayana societies and Theravada societies. 
of course, Mahayana societies tend to be more open to diverse spirituality and rituals. Theravada societies, much more skeptical about that. They tend to put more emphasis on the psychological experience of enlightenment. That's a, the possible tension there would be something that would need to be considered. And here just quickly are some early examples of Buddhist influence in Japan from the 6th, 7th and early 8th centuries. So just as Buddhism became established as the sort of state ideology. Now, we know that even after Buddhism began to go into decline in India, Chinese and Japanese monks continued their own intellectual exchange well into the Middle Ages. And this intellectual exchange, as well as trade, continued even after official relations between China and Japan were broken off in 894. Now, uh, this issue bears a little bit of a comment because, uh, again, there is a tendency for modern writers to resort to culturalist arguments. Uh, there's a line of thinking that runs, especially among Chinese nationalists, that the Japanese high official, Sugawara no Michizane, who had proposed ending the tradition of sending Japanese envoys to China, uh, was perhaps motivated by his embarrassment because he didn't know enough about China and his Chinese was very bad and so forth. And historically, this idea is absolutely preposterous. It's preposterous because Michizane was known as a master of written Chinese. Uh, he was very, very well versed in Chinese study. He huge fan of Chinese calligraphy. He collected a lot of Chinese writing. Um, very, very serious scholar of the subject. So it's a very silly argument. Uh, even if we could argue perhaps that his spoken Chinese was not particularly good, that wasn't relevant because all across East Asia, diplomacy was conducted using written classical Chinese. Um, this was, it was the, the written language of classical Chinese that was the, the lingua franca of ancient East Asia. It wasn't any spoken language that connected people together. It was the writing. So that I think is an important point. It shows us how people are very quick to jump on cultural explanations when they're missing the broader story of connecting people together. Uh, and in fact, if you ask, okay, well, then why did Sugawara no Michizane propose breaking off uh, relations with China? It was, again, uh, a very geopolitical issue in a very, very clear issue of real politic. It was very, very expensive. And at this time, the Tang Dynasty was collapsing. It was impossible to guarantee the safety of diplomats. And therefore, uh, Japan was not alone in saying, maybe we shouldn't send missions to China for a while because it's very expensive and very dangerous and the, the benefits do not outweigh the cost. So uh, there's a tendency when people look at history, they want to take these very simple cultural arguments and stick them on top of complicated geopolitical concerns as a way of making sense of them. But usually that just ends up obscuring what really happened. And then we don't understand the relations among Asian countries when we do that. Even after the Tang Dynasty fell 10 years later and was replaced by a series of competing kingdoms during the era of division, exchange between Japan and China continued. The Japanese court and military governments during the early Middle Ages were reluctant to jumpstart official diplomatic relations because doing so meant joining the Chinese tributary system. And this would require Japan to admit that it had a sort of inferior status to China, which the Japanese court was reluctant to do. However, in the end, this ultimately mattered very little because trade in ideas and trade in goods continued unabated. The history, of, I think, of unofficial Sino-Japanese relations has always been much greater in scale and endurance than any officially sanctioned ones. And for centuries, Chinese and Japanese merchants continued their work and nobles in both countries sought to acquire rare items from their counterparts in the other. Chinese nobles valued Japanese swords and washi paper, while Japanese nobles valued Chinese paintings, ceramics, and calligraphy. In the early 13th century, the leading Japanese courtier, Sayonji Kintsune, sent the Song Chinese emperor a gift of prized wood to make a pavilion. And then he received in exchange a great sum of cash and many treasures, including a water buffalo and what appears to have been a parrot. 
So this is an example of how both sides benefited from the cultural capital that could be acquired through this type of exchange. They're both interested in each other's countries, they value treasures and interesting items and even animals that come from each other's countries. So even if their governments are not officially in communication, China and Japan were quite happily having these relations. And so here are some examples of what were called uh, in the early Middle Ages katamono. Um, of course, this kata refers to the Tang dynasty, but uh, katamono meant any kind of product that was imported from China. And these were very popular in Japan at that time. From the Middle Ages through to the early modern era, Buddhism played a decreasingly significant role in providing an intellectual foundation for Sino-Japanese relations. Well, what we might term a Confucian ethos became increasingly important. When the third Muromachi Shogun, Yoshimitsu, reopened relations with China in the late 14th century, and as the Edo Bakufu managed its trading relations with China during the 17th through to the mid 19th centuries, they often deployed Confucian logic when they were trying to shore up those relations. Now, this bears some comment because, of course, in the contemporary world, Confucianism is very, very controversial. It's, uh, it's undergone an almost bizarre transformation. Confucianism has gone from being deplored as a relic of prehistory in China in the early 19th century, uh, relentlessly attacked by the CCP until the end of the Cultural Revolution, uh, to today being embraced as a tool of political propaganda by the very same CCP. So it's had a very interesting development how Confucianism has been seen in modern times in China. Uh, of course, this has led to some, some issues and misunderstandings as well. One misunderstanding is that Confucianism is necessarily China-centric. And of course, you can understand why the CCP likes this idea, because they can say, if you respect Confucianism, you have to do what China says. But this is actually a misunderstanding. Already by the early modern era, intellectuals across Asia had already come to interpret Confucian norms in terms of their own respective countries. So just to give one example, the Japanese philosopher Ogyu Sorai, for instance, uh, he argued that your own country was the center of your world. So you respect other countries, but the center of your own world is your own country. So it's not, China is not the center of everyone's world. China was, was the center of Confucius's world because Confucius was Chinese. But for a Japanese person, although they respect China and they want equal relations with China, Japan is the center of their world. And so for an Indian philosopher, India would be the center of their world. And that's how they sort of look at the other countries. So Confucianism doesn't need to be China-centric. That's a bit of a distortion. Uh, being a Confucianist for these philosophers meant being an enlightened Asian citizen rather than a Sinophile. Moreover, the essence of Confucianism has always been on the community and the family. So that's part of that shared sense of harmony that, of course, Haruoka-san started uh, and several other presenters have mentioned. Uh, so it's, it's the family and the community bringing people together. That's more important than the state. I don't want to put too much emphasis on this, but when the CCP says being a good Confucianist means doing what the government says, it's difficult to describe that as anything other than a distortion. I think Confucius himself would have been very angry at that mischaracterization of his thought, which was all about connecting people and community rather than governments. Uh, so for Confucius, when he talked about ancient China, the ways of ancient China were an example of what to aim for. They weren't supposed to be some sort of totality of ethical or intellectual experience. Another concern with utilizing Confucianism as an intellectual foundation for inter-Asian relations is the suspicion that Confucianism has traditionally held towards merchants. And this has given rise to the idea that maybe Confucianism is anti-capitalist. So how, if you're a modern business person in Asia, can you support Confucianism? That's the question. Uh, but actually, if we do the research into this, you could say philosophically, there, there might be a conflict there. But if you look at the practical history of people's relations, we find that in at least Japan and China, there was no such conflict. The Confucian suspicion of merchants was always based on the idea that because they made money, 
merchants were contributing nothing to society. But it was very easy for people to argue that making an economy work and employing people is a major contribution to your society, which means being a good merchant is completely compatible with Confucianism. And moreover, if you're a successful business person, you can invest back in your community and help other people, which again is the whole point of harmony and Confucianism. So a good example of this is the famous entrepreneur Shibasawa Eiji, who invested enormous amounts of his wealth in charities and schools, but was a devout Confucianist all his life. He truly believed that business people had a moral obligation to help improve their communities. And even by Shibasawa's time, this was not a new idea. If you go back to the Edo period, there was Shingaku philosophy, which had very similar ideas. People like Baigan uh, were arguing that merchants had a very strong ethic and they were very committed to their community. And that one of the points of being a good merchant was to contribute to your community and helping people. So this is not, this is not, not a new idea by any means. I think that one of the most important lessons to take away from the Sino-Japanese historical experience is that exchange continued even during times of conflict. And that's a phenomenon that I've particularly engaged with in some of my own research on early 20th century uh, intellectuals. Um, so this is the last thing I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, conventional wisdom basically holds that over the course of the 1920s and 1930s, relations between Japanese and Chinese intellectuals increasingly broke down, reflecting worsening relations between the Japanese and Chinese states, as the Japanese state pursued expansionist policies, culminating in efforts to colonize the mainland. This perspective, however, is based on reading political determinism into the intellectual sphere. It's basically saying, again, because the countries are acting in, cer in a certain way, then the people are thinking in a certain way, which is very appealing because it makes everything seem so nice and simple. But of course, it's inaccurate. We know that actually Japanese and Chinese intellectuals maintained active exchange through the course of the 1930s. Neither were these relations sanitized or devoid of politics. Rather, intellectuals often discussed politics forcefully, but they were also capable of seeing each other as individuals whose values and ideas did not necessarily align with those of their states. And an excellent example is provided by the famous Chinese writer Lu Shun, who with his friend, the Japanese bookstore owner Uchiyama Kanzo, presided over active intellectual exchange among Chinese and Japanese thinkers and writers in Shanghai. So just to give some quick examples of this, so this is Lucian and Uchiyama Kanzo here in summer 1933. And there's a lot of pictures of the various Chinese and Japanese writers that met each other in Shanghai through uh, these individuals. So here as an example, um, Uchiyama Kakichi, so a famous woodcut uh, teacher who was Uchiyama Kanzo's younger brother. So he's visiting with some students and Lucian is teaching them about Chinese woodcut traditions. Here is Uchiyama and his wife with Lucian and Suzuki Daisetsu, the very famous Zen uh, scholar. So when he visited from Japan, he made a point of stopping off and meeting them. Um, and here, Noguchi uh, Yonijiro, very, very controversial nationalist writer, but it didn't matter. There were left-wing writers, right-wing writers. They were all welcome as long as they respected each other and they were able to discuss in this type of environment. Uh, the environment, of course, itself, Uchiyama Kanzo's bookstore, which was, became a sort of salon for these encounters, uh, was no doubt shaped by the proprietor's devout belief in love and brotherhood among all humanity. But even though he was inspired by Christianity, I think we can argue that much the same could be found in the Confucian concept of humaneness, because, of course, this is rooted in respect and concern for others. So in sum, uh, the lessons that we can draw from the Sino-Japanese historical experience are that regardless of whether it finds its origin in Buddhist or Confucian foundations, a mutual respect for each other's culture and identity is necessary. 
contrary to the CCP claims to represent a single Confucian perspective, inter-Asian collaboration can only truly blossom when no one country is permitted a position of ideological authority, irrespective of the economic power of the actors involved. So if we want to have real inter-Asian collaboration, we have to encourage this respect for each other, uh, but seize people as equals, regardless of how much economic power one may have over another. Uh, another thing to note is that official relations and state involvement in intellectual and cultural and economic exchange as well uh, is shown to be the exception rather than the rule in Sino-Japanese history. Now that's not to deny the importance of states, but it's rather to point out that they are not strictly necessary to successful relations among peoples. So we are able to have quite successful economic relations, cultural relations, intellectual relations without governments necessarily agreeing on everything that isn't necessarily required. Um, I think the contemporary tendency, especially when I look at my students, for example, uh, to resort to the government in all matters, so that the students will often say the government should do something about this. Um, and I find that rather ironic. It, it goes against the Confucian tenet of self-responsibility, but it also goes against the very real Sino-Japanese historical experience, where people counted on respect for each other uh, rather than the government to manage their relations. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ka uh, Kamei Daichi, uh, for your excellent uh, presentation. Very comprehensive picture of uh, Sino-Japanese uh, 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 historical experience. Uh, China and Japan uh, often understood as uh, uh, rivals or enemies. Uh, but, uh, you know, still we have lots of common uh, historical uh, and intellectual assets uh, between ourselves. Um, well, uh, with this, uh, I would like to introduce you uh, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Aditya, Aditya Pratap Deo. Uh, he's a distinguished professor at Department of History at St. Stephen's College, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Soka University's uh, uh, brother uh, university in India. And he's talking about uh, One Asia, One World, uh, Meditations on Plural Universalism. Uh, please, uh, Professor Dea, you have a floor. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Mr. Harauka. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm really grateful to the Soka University South Asia Research Center for uh, allowing me this opportunity to join this distinguished panel of scholars and professionals uh, on this very important matter. I'm especially grateful to Professor Mukesh Williams, my former senior from St. Stephen's College for inviting me for this and the staff of the research center as well. I'm grateful to some of my students uh, from India who have joined us at this time. Uh, they have been waiting for some time, so thank you for your patience. My presentation is going to be somewhat general given the constraint uh, of time. Uh, it is also going to be from the perspective of a historian which uh, I will find uh, a difficult path to follow at this point, given that Professor Andrew has given such, a, such an instructive historian's presentation textbook almost to us. But I'm, I take comfort from the fact that what I'm going to say resonates a little with what he has said and also with what Professor Williams said at the beginning. So my topic is One Asia, One World Meditations on Plural Universalism. The phrase Asia as one with the verb is in the middle, I think hides the secret anxiety. It hints that if there is something like one Asia, it is not quite coming together as it should. And therefore that some work still needs to be done to return Asia to itself. 
In a world increasingly beset by strife and crisis, the latest being the pandemic, this is indeed a laudable call. For only if we stand together in love and friendship that we can pull back from the brink. But what is this Asia we are assuming and how best can it be put together again? In this short presentation, I wish to argue that the idea of Asia as historically articulated in the modern period has been by conception, if not intentionally, an exclusivist one. And therefore, the project of One Asia, if continued to be thought of within this framework, will not quite escape this condition of being ex exclusivist in its orientation. This will defeat the very purpose for which we are gathered today. However, if the idea of Asia as an entity is rethought away from a binarized idea of culture and society through which it has been mostly framed, and the task of making Asia one is displaced into a field of forces where cultures and societies are intrinsically hybrid, we can be hopeful about our future. The idea of Asia as historically been very protein as well as quite contested. It is not possible here for me to list out all the possible iterations of the idea, but a few powerful inf and influential ones need a quick, even if an inadequate recall here. The Orientalists have conceived of Asia as at once exotic and slothful, ethereal and messy, a civilization yet not quite a civilization. In response, a group of enthusiastic Asianists have overturned this image on its head, setting up Asia as the soul of the world that either the West never had or had lost forever. Outside of these clash of civilization understandings of Asia, but not disconnected with them, there have been functionalist ideas of Asia that have been articulated in relation to specific turns in world and Asian politics and economy since the middle of the 20th century. In his 2010 essay titled, Asia is not one, in the Journal of Asian Studies, Amitav Acharya has pointed out these influential ideas of Asia that he calls imperialist, nationalist, universalist, regionalist, and exceptionalist in their approach. Most of these ideas of Asia even those that seek to emphasize spiritual aspects and thus have a universalist flavor to them are exclusivist. They attempt to think of Asia as a distinct, if not unique entity. In fact, the idea of Asia qua Asia and not any other place, say Europe or America, at first glance cannot logically be anything other than exclusivist. But that need not be the case. Given the enormity of the civilizational problems facing the world today, especially those arising from selfishness and greed, manifested in experiences of unfreedom, inequality, and a ballooning environmental crisis that have put the very survival of our world, indeed life on earth as we know it at stake, there is an urgent need to change the framework within which we think of Asia or one Asia. I submit that we need to work towards a conception of Asia that does not work through the binary principle of us and them. I believe that at their, at their core belief, and especially if they were thinking at this time, both Tenshin and Tagore too would have liked us to do this. Let us think of how this can be possible. Here I turn to two well-known theories that provide us with alternative frameworks in this context. In their understanding of societies as rhizomatic structures, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Kuatari, in my understanding, have posited the idea of cultures as necessarily interconnected through and at multiple points, always hybrid and densely intertwined. Similarly, in his theory of heteroglossia, Mikhail Bakhtin asserts the inherent interrelational aspect and the fundamental hybridity of cultures. In these two conceptions of culture, there is no point of origin, 
no linear descent, and no hierarchy of being. All cultures are, to use the anthropologist Kathleen Stewart's evocative phrase, always in a way caught up in the middle of things. Think of the geographical entity we could hypothetically call Asia, and you will see how this has always been the case. Every part of this entity is a complex composition located within a multiplicity of points of connection, a hybrid all the way, always changing and reshaping. Whether you take particular subregions like the Middle East or South Asia or Southeast Asia, or you take the relationship between any of these subregions, say South Asia and Central Asia, or you take the relationship between any Asian subregion and any other part of the world, say South Asia and East Africa, you will find that all these regions are composed of and are constantly recomposing each other and more. It will be difficult to separate out and distill an Asia or an Africa that is just itself and nothing else. The task of bringing Asia together in reminding it of the essential unity of its mind and spirit therefore must necessarily be a task of reminding it of its unity with the rest of the world as well. This is not to say that we are all the same. It is to say that we are all related in a way that makes it impossible to reduce us to any one entity hermetically set apart from another. Even though Tagore had suggested that there was, to quote him, a common bond of spiritualism between Asian cultures and society, he was pointing towards the higher human unities that join all the peoples of the world. His universal, though sometimes spoken of as an Asian universal, was at its core a plural universal, in that he thought of Asia as composed of influences from all over the world. Asia is one, is best realized therefore, as Asia is one with the world. Indeed, only if we think like this, as Tagore warned us, we may be able yet to prevent our divisions from destroying our diverse yet shared world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Deo, Deo for uh, having introduced us a very important point that is, uh, you know, uh, not to be exclusive, but to be uh, harmonious with the rest of the world. Uh, and, you know, inclusiveness must be a very important concept. Uh, and uh, that is perhaps uh, uh, maybe uh, quite uh, similar to, uh, you know, my uh, uh, familiar area, which is, uh, uh, you know, trade policy. Uh, sometimes we call it open visionaries when we talk about uh, uh, Asian, uh, you know, Asian, Asia oriented uh, free trade uh, area. So thank you so much for this point. Uh, sorry again about uh, my uh, uh, poor time management. Uh, uh, you know, we, it's uh, about uh, nine minutes until uh, seven o'clock. So we have we, we don't have much time for a Q and A, uh, but uh, I, I thank to all the distinguished speakers for uh, introducing us uh, uh, excellent uh, remarks and uh, excellent uh, suggestions on this topic. And uh, I, I personally learned a lot from all of you, a very enlightening and informative. Uh, but uh, you know, if, if you don't mind, uh, uh, could I invite uh, uh, perhaps one or two persons uh, who would like to ask any question to any speaker? Do you have any question amongst uh, participants, students, uh, or professors? If not, uh, I just maybe want to say uh, some, not question, but uh, uh, maybe comments on, uh, on this uh, uh, 
symposium. Uh, that is, you know, I think we have very uh, good discussion, good, uh, uh, you know, uh, presentations uh, in in our panel, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, I had two two things in my mind. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we should perhaps uh, uh, maybe, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, keep going on, you know, analysis and, uh, uh, I mean, observation on the history of Asian countries, uh, because that would perhaps lead to mutual understanding of our countries in Asia. Uh, Asian countries are being connected uh, closely with each other uh, in the long history. And today, unfortunately, uh, at least uh, to my knowledge, uh, in, in Japan, uh, there are not necessarily so many people who are keen on the history of Asia or who, who have a good knowledge about uh, the history of Asia. So we should uh, uh, have more time, more energy to learn about the history of Asia, uh, you know, cross connections among the nations in Asia. That is anyway, very interesting intellectual uh, experience. A and also uh, another thing is, is perhaps, uh, you know, without, uh, for, with, with avoiding, uh, file avoiding to, you know, be exclusive uh, against uh, uh, the other regions, uh, we need to, you know, how do you say, um, make some efforts to prevail uh, this, you know, Asian commonality, which is, in my understanding, uh, harmony, respect for harmony, uh, and uh, uh, yes, respect for social cohesion. That will be perhaps helpful in resolving the issues which we are now facing in the international politics or in, the, uh, or in the capitalist economy. So uh, maybe Japan Spotlight and the uh, Soka University, South Asia Research Center uh, would uh, maybe cooperate with each other in doing some work for promoting those concepts. Well, uh, any other opinion about uh, what I said? Please, yes. Mukesh Sensei, do you have any idea? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Haruka-san. Mm -hmm. And yes, I agree with you. And we would definitely like to uh, bring a small kind of booklet uh, which would be part of the proceedings and if you so think we could uh, publish it and let uh, the speakers uh, make it more uh, you know scholarly placing the references and um, adding things to it and it could be a very good thing we can discuss that mm -hmm. uh, further if everybody agrees and we could expand the presentation into a, a regular paper. And that would be a very good idea, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one, more, one more question is about, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this symposium. I think this is recorded. Yes, it is. is that right? Maybe uh, we can share the recording. I mean, the summary of the record, records. Uh, and, and also, if possible, uh, uh, if we don't, if uh, the speakers do not mind, uh, you know, uh, PowerPoint materials. Yes. Show us. If we can share those materials, that will be fascinating. So at the moment, it is going live on you on uh, Facebook. Okay. So mm -hmm. people can watch I see. Uh, whatever has happened. So, mm -hmm. and it will be there and mm -hmm. be, and PowerPoints can also be shared, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you showed mm -hmm. has been, is there online mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that perhaps the students can share 
Yes. This, uh, you know, panelist uh, discussion. Yes. Yeah. And okay. we can give it to you so that you, we can use it yes. for mm -hmm. uh, preparing a report and publication. Aditya, you have something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of my students has a question. Yes. Please put it on in the chat box. Yes, right. Uh, question to Professor Andrew. Do you think growing geopolitical tensions in Asia were posed as an impediment to uh, foregoing uh, shared Asian identity? That is a question from Muhammad right. Farid. <coughs> Please. Right. Uh, thank you for your question. That's that's a very good one. I think that is very difficult to answer. It will depend on uh, part of a point I was making earlier about whether we allow that identity to be shaped by state actors. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, this controversy in Australia recently with Chinese involvement and so forth, the Chinese government has interpreted that as essentially saying culture, trade, politics, it's all the same thing. And if we have a political issue with your country, then culturally and economically, we are going to punish those relationships as well. That is a great risk when, when those things are all bound up together. Uh, as long as we are dealing with partners who take that position, it's going to, it's definitely going to be a hindrance because it means that every geopolitical tension is going to necessarily impact any attempt at building good trade or cultural relations. If, on the other hand, we can argue against that position and try to separate those things, then there's no reason why that would be a problem. So I think it very much depends on how we respond to this sort of situation, especially not only limited to China, but especially with uh, China's actions just this week, uh, very much taking the position that culture and economics is secondary to political issues. Um, that's not a position I think that as intellectuals, we should be quick to agree with. I think we should be offering a challenge to that and trying to say that relations among Asians and any attempt to build a shared Asian consciousness should be beyond those geopolitical concerns. Hmm. So I don't know if I did really did a good job of answering that, but that's a very thoughtful question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your good answer. So uh, it's seven o'clock, uh, I think, uh, uh, I'm sorry about uh, uh, my mis mismanagement, but I think uh, it's time over. So please, uh, uh, I have to pass the uh, uh, floor to Professor Masa, Masa, Masaki Yamaoka uh, for closing remarks. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to give a closing remark. Uh, thank you very much for attending our today's conference. Uh, I'm Masaki Yamaoka, a professor of Faculty of Letters, Soka University. Since I had stayed at St. Stephen's College in Delhi for three months last year, so I was appointed a member of South Asia Research Center. I appreciate all of you for having a precious opportunity and for sharing our belief Asia is one with you. I think the most important feature of India is diversity. India has a religious, ethnic, and linguistic diversity. When I had stayed in India, I had learned India's profound tolerance. In today's conference, I could confirm the keyword tolerance and possibility to realization of one Asia, one world. I'm very happy to share this great opportunity with you. Uh, on behalf of Soka University, I would like to express our gratitude wholeheartedly. In addition, special thanks to Mr. Haraoka, a Japan Spot Japan Economic Foundation, for helping this conference and our South Asia Research Center's activity. Please give a big applause to all of today's uh, presenters. We hope to continue this activity. We are looking forward to meeting with you again in your future. Near future. Uh, that is all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Teramoto-san, yes. please say. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for participation. Uh, we would like to close.
the symposium. Okay, thank you.